The Apostle Paul warned us concerning a future Antichrist dictator. How can a Jewish evangelist who lived 2,000 years ago know anything about our own generation that it's facing? The answer is in his second letter to the church at Thessalonia. Paul wrote that the coming of what he called the lawless one will be accompanied by the working of Satan with every kind of power, sign, and lying wonder, and with every wicked deception directed against those who are perishing. Why? Because, Paul wrote, they refused the love of the truth that would have saved them. For this reason, because they are destitute of a love of truth, God will send a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. I wonder what is this lie that they will believe? We'll explore this prophetic topic and hopefully many viewers will be protected from the coming lie by believing on the world's one and only Savior. The Jerusalem Channel is made with the support of you, our viewers. Thank you for watching. Good morning from Jerusalem. I'm having my pomegranate juice mixed in with my orange juice and my cappuccino. It's always so good here. This restaurant is usually packed out, but we're sitting here in an empty restaurant and we thank God that the men that run this restaurant are keeping it open, even though there's no business at this time. After October the 7th, it's been months and months, but the massacres that took place have caused a war, and the war is ongoing, meaning that tourists are not coming here, and it's very difficult times for the local people to make a living without the tourists coming. And so I'd like to encourage you to come because there are parts where the war is not really affecting the nation, and it's safe to be here. It's our work at the Jerusalem Channel to try to explain these times, to explain Bible prophecy. And it's not given to scare us, but to prepare us to be ready for the coming of the Lord and to help prepare this nation to return back to God because Jesus is coming, Messiah is coming. So we want to encourage you to support the Jerusalem Channel because we're trying our best to support various humanitarian organizations here that are doing their best and we're doing our best to help all the peoples of the region, not only the Israelis, but the Arabs who are so needful, especially the Christian Arabs. This restaurant is run by a Christian Arab and we're so grateful that he is open at this time. Look at this beautiful breakfast. Thank you. Thank you for working just for us. Welcome, enjoy your time. Enjoy your meal. Thank you. So I'm going to say shalom. God bless you. Thank you for supporting the Jerusalem Channel. Shalom, I'm Christine Dark. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul warned that people who refuse the love of the truth will be powerfully deluded as a judgment befalling all who disbelieve the truth and delighted in wickedness. And as a consequence, they will believe the lie. Let's listen to this highly relevant passage from 2 Thessalonians 2, starting with verse 1. Now we ask you, brethren, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, and our gathering together to him. That's the description of the rapture, our gathering together to the descending Lord in the atmosphere. He said, don't be so quickly upset or alarmed when someone claims that we said the day of the Lord has already come. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the apostasy Literally, the departure, the falling away takes place first, 
and the man of sin, speaking of Antichrist, destined for destruction, is revealed. Paul said he will oppose and exalt himself above every so-called God and object of worship. And as a result, he will seat himself in the sanctuary of God, declaring himself to be God. Paul asked, don't you recollect that I repeatedly told you about these things when I was still with you? But you know what is now restraining him so that he will be revealed only when his time comes. For the secret of lawlessness is already at work, but only until the restrainer holding it back is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord will destroy with the breath of his mouth. And Paul continued in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one will be accompanied by the power of Satan with miraculous signs and lying wonders and every type of evil to deceive those who refuse to love the truth that would have saved them. And for this reason, Paul wrote, God will send them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie. Well, in a minute, we'll talk further about what this lie might be. First, I want to say how I'm noticing with increasingly alarm how people are shedding biblical truth. So many prefer to believe what they foolishly call their own truth, whatever that means. Even an historic institution like the Church of England is toying with the idea of making God gender neutral as if they could recreate the Almighty in the image of current woke culture. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He didn't say to the mother or to the parent. He said no one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus. And when he taught his disciples to pray, he started out the Lord's Prayer by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Even in some denominations, the Lord's Prayer is called the Our Father. For decades, the gender of God has prompted debate within many traditional church denominations, with, with many leaders calling for the male pronouns he and him to be scrapped in favor of gender-neutral or female alternatives. In what would mark a departure from centuries of tradition, Anglican bishops are to plan to discuss gendered language referencing God in church services later this year. The move is being criticized by conservatives who warn that male and female imagery is not interchangeable. Liberal churchgoers welcome the controversy, claiming that a theological view of God as exclusively male, promotes discrimination. A national campaign group for gender equality in the Church of England also welcomed the move to consider more inclusive language in authorized liturgy. However, according to the scriptures, fathers and mothers are not interchangeable roles. Fathers and mothers were intended by God to relate to their offspring in different ways. The fact that God is called Father in the Bible cannot be substituted by Mother without changing the meaning and moving toward ancient sacred feminine worship. Nor can Father be gender neutralized to parent without a loss of meaning. If the Church's liturgical commission dares to tamper with these concepts, the crucial question remains. Will they not be subtracting from or adding to the Word of God, which is forbidden by this book? They will definitely uproot the fatherhood of God from being grounded in Scripture. You see, according to the admonition in Deuteronomy 12.32, God said you must not add to nor take away from this Word. And so Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 2.11, that because people reject truth, they will become ensnared in strong delusion. Not only are we witnessing a great apostasy in the churches, 
it's astounding how many are openly delighting in wickedness, just as the Apostle Paul predicted. People are taking a high degree of pleasure in distressingly evil, malicious behavior. We're seeing perversity of an alarming nature every day, an increasing brazenness in the way people speak, behave, and present themselves, flaunting biblical values, despising and mocking everything that is good and wholesome. When Roe v. Wade was overturned in the USA, instead of repenting for the millions of abortions, people became more angry and belligerent, which is a foreshadowing of attitudes in Revelation chapter 9. And in this chapter, horrific judgments of the wrath of God are described in which a third of mankind will be killed. But verses 20 and 21 reveal the stubborn hearts of survivors. Twice, the Apostle John states that they will refuse to repent of their murders and sorceries, of their fornications and thefts. Even now, whether it's the National Football League Super Bowl halftime show, or the Grammys, or Hollywood, They all promote overt satanic symbols, met with wild applause and public approval. But what's frightening about Paul's text in 2 Thessalonians 2.11 is that hard hearts result in a powerful delusion sent by God himself as retribution so that stubborn hearts will believe the lie. Now, let's stop here for a moment. Bible scholars point out that this sentence includes the definite article, the lie. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul wrote that truth rejectors will believe the lie. This implies that a major lie will be the ruination of multitudes of people on this planet. Those who have resisted and refused the glorious truth of the gospel, truth capable of saving everybody who dares to come by faith to Messiah for salvation. The truth of the gospel will save anyone who humbles himself or herself and says, Lord, I'm a sinner. I need the salvation that you, Jesus, procured for me at the cross. I bow my heart and receive you and your atonement purchased for me by the salvation of your blood. But for multitudes who disbelieve gospel truth, what is the lie? What is the misleading influence that will be their damnation? Well, this question sent me to the Lord and to the Bible commentaries. Bearing in mind the context which concerns the revelation of the future Antichrist, I found this interesting translation by J.B. Phillips in his New Testament in modern English, quote, God sends upon them, therefore, the full force of evil's delusion so that they put their faith in an utter fraud and meet the inevitable judgment of all who have refused to believe the truth and who have made evil their playfellow, end quote. Because disbelievers will not care if matters are true or not, does that ever sound familiar? Therefore, the Antichrist will dazzle them with special marvels and frauds to mislead them. By refusing to accept the love of the truth, God will remove from them the power of discernment to know true from the false. An illustration of how this works is referenced in the Hebrew Bible in 2 Chronicles chapter 18 concerning the weak King Ahab, who didn't care about truth, and therefore, as a judgment, the Lord sent a lying spirit to entice him into a death trap in battle. Sin will become its own punishment. But why would a righteous God use a lying spirit to deceive King Ahab? We must grapple with difficult questions like this. Why God would do such a thing? And to learn the answer, we need to know the character of King Ahab. If we study his life, we see he had repeatedly refused to submit and obey God, although many times God showed his power and mercy to Ahab. But Ahab refused to believe a truthful prophet sent to him by God. So in response 
to Ahab's constant choice of sin. And because Ahab preferred the lies of false prophets over the true prophet, God gave permission to a fallen angel, a lying spirit, to deceive him. God allowed the lying spirit to proceed due to the fact that Ahab had already rejected God's faithful warnings. Theologians have also been grappling for ages about God hardening the heart of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Many people have asked me about this. If God hardened the heart of Pharaoh, was it fair to punish him? Well, we have to understand that Pharaoh had deliberately chosen to bring further judgment upon himself and his nation by repeatedly resisting God's commands so that eventually God let Pharaoh's heart set like stone. Although God does honor free will, he also knows the disposition and predilection of hearts of all men and women. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. commented that Pharaoh's hard heart tells us that evil is recalcitrant and very determined. And the German Jewish philosopher Eric Fromm speculated that Pharaoh's heart hardened because he kept on doing evil. It hardened to a point where no more change or repentance was possible. Now, the Bible commentaries explain that Paul's phrase, God will send them a strong delusion, should be explained as an effectual inward working of error. This means not just a mere indifference to truth, but a real influence of error upon rebellious hearts to believe the lie. And I repeat, the Greek has the definite article, the lie, which the Antichrist would have people in the future to believe, namely the falsehood that he will disseminate about himself, claiming to be God, and thus his demand for everybody to be branded with his damnable mark amounting to 666 in order to be able to buy and sell. That's all predicted in Revelation chapter 13. And the world is increasingly being set up for the ultimate big lie. Unidentified flying objects are increasingly in the news. Alien abductions will likely be the narrative to explain away the disappearance of millions of Bible believers when the church age concludes. The fullness of the Gentiles is finished and Jesus comes for us in the clouds. The number of UFO sightings will greatly increase after God takes away the restrainer that I read about in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. Bible teacher Chuck Missler of Blessed Memory said that UFO sightings this side of the rapture amount to occasional leaks compared to the flood of deception that will come after the rapture after the restrainer is removed. Already fake news incessantly and sometimes shamelessly pours forth false narratives by pundits, politicians, bankers, medical administrators, educators, day and night, if we're not circumspect. Our times call for the greatest of discernment. Leaders of nations have convinced themselves of many lies. For example, Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard recently unveiled a purported ballistic missile with the words, Death to Israel, painted down the side in Hebrew. Iran's Tasneem news agency showed menacing images of what appears to be a surface-to-surface missile in a launcher. The mullahs are promoting this lie that they will destroy the Jewish state. When this word of God says that you cannot curse what he has blessed, And he has definitely blessed Israel to return to their ancestral land after nearly 2,000 years of exile in fulfillment of many Bible prophecies. God's fury will be unleashed in the Ezekiel War described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. How ironic that while Iran chants death to Israel, the Jewish state is a relatively happy place compared to other nations. Israel is now home to 53% of world Jewry and is being called the startup nation because it innovates and flourishes despite the menace of anti-Semitism. The Abraham Accords continue to deliver positive security and global trade rewards to Israel. 
And little tiny Israel helps to alleviate humanitarian disasters like earthquakes around the world with field hospitals and rescue teams who are disproportionately large compared to the size of the nation itself, which is only 9 million in population. The Gallup Organization released its World Happiness Report in 2022, showing that Israel's ranking in the survey has improved from number 12 to 9 out of 146 nations that were assessed. The survey's happiness criteria is based on GDP per capita, social support, healthy life expectancy, and general freedoms. Countries ahead of Israel were Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Sweden, and Norway. But Israel was ranked ahead of New Zealand, Austria, Ireland, Australia, Germany, Canada, the United States, and the UK. Countries that signed normalization agreements with Israel as part of the Abraham Accords also ranked in the top 25 so-called happy nations, with Bahrain at 21 and the United Arab Emirates at 24. By contrast, Iran, which daily threatens Israel's existence, was ranked way down at 110. Meanwhile, the world is being groomed by lying spirits for the Great Tribulation and the big lie of the Antichrist. There are many other issues dealing with truth versus error in the news. When we consider how rapidly technology is developing, it's hard to determine what's a lie, what's fanciful, and what is reality. Recently in the news, there was this headline, a rogue scientist has huge unease over the future of Chinese babies that he gene edited. The scientist was sentenced to three years in prison after an international outcry when it emerged that he had altered the genes of twin girls at the embryonic stage in an attempt to make them immune to HIV infection. The technique is called CRISPR, which enables scientists to edit DNA far more easily than was previously possible. According to the South of China Morning Post, the twins live a normal, peaceful, undisturbed life with their parents, but when asked if he worried about their future, the scientist said he feels a huge unease, stating that he carried out his bold experiment too quickly. His pioneering feat was widely condemned by the medical establishment and raised dystopian fears of re-engineering the human race. However, since the scientist has been released from prison, he has launched his own laboratory in Beijing predicting an approaching golden decade for gene therapies. The article cited stated that the scientist has been invited to visit University of Oxford to discuss his methods and vision to free people from inherited diseases. Sounds good? What is the truth, though, in such a dilemma? I would rather cling to the Word of God, which promises in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name, who forgives all our sins and who heals all our diseases. Of course, we have to take that promise for healing by faith. And faith is not a casual thing. It has to be worked on by reading and taking in this word. Meanwhile, some eminent bioethicists think that the Chinese scientist should not be allowed to publish his research. But apparently he's already opened the proverbial Pandora's box. In Greek mythology, out of curiosity, a woman named Pandora opened the container, but then released physical and emotional curses upon the world. And as one physician recently warned, once Pandora's box has been opened, it becomes impossible to reverse the consequences. Not just gene editing, there is also the foreboding dilemma on the horizon of decision-making abilities of artificial intelligence. That, too, is causing anxiety. Many predict that artificial intelligence will inevitably become superhuman. The AI industry prefers that we sleepwalk and not ask questions, while alarmists say runaway AI could annihilate the human race. As Joe Allen wrote in his article, Countdown to Gigadeth, 
Many techno elites believe that we're adrift in a godless cosmos. And the scary thing is some technocrats would sacrifice humanity to create a digital god. China has cyborg ambitions, as do Russia and NATO. Vladimir Putin famously proclaimed, Artificial intelligence is the future. Whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become ruler of the world. Well, that sounds apocalyptic. According to a background report from the UK Ministry of Defense, at the core of future military advantage will be effective integration of humans, artificial intelligence, and robotics into war-fighting systems. Human-machine teams will exploit the capabilities of people and technology to outperform opponents. Transhumanist author Joe Allen also wrote that in the hands of elite predators, these digital tools are deadly serious. When leaders aren't deploying tech against rival countries, they're turning it on their own citizens. For example, Clearview AI facial recognition enabled the cops to track down January 6 protesters against the government in the USA. The problem is any nation that fails to embrace AI will fall behind its rivals. According to Revelation 13, in the future, there will be a speaking image of the world leader known as Antichrist. The image will appear to come to life. Eschatologists believe these verses refer to artificial intelligence. Today, we already have robots that speak and interact with human beings. And with the period known as the Great Tribulation on the horizon, it's vital that we heed the warnings of Jesus to be on our guard against deception. So concerning our subject today, the big lie, I want to share with you a highly important and startling verse in 1 John 2.22. The apostle asked, who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist denying the Father and the Son. So then, to deny Jesus as the Christ, as God's anointed one, is to deny something major. To deny Jesus as the one anointed by the Father, sent by Father God to save his people from their sins, who was anointed to preach good news to the poor, to set the prisoners free, is to deny the Father and the Son. To deny that Jesus is Messiah is to deny the relationship that God and Son have with each other. Such a denial opens the door to deception and the twisting of truth. So this is the summary of all the Bible commentaries I've studied this week. I want you to know that Satan doesn't care if you believe that Jesus existed. Satan doesn't care if you believe in the historical Jesus. What Satan doesn't want you to do is to receive Jesus the Christ, the anointed one, sent by the Father to save us from our sins and to bring us back into fellowship with the Almighty. Only through Jesus, the anointed one, the Mashiach, can we be reconciled to God. The devil is not a playful kitten who will give you a little scratch every now and then. No, he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He goes right for the jugular vein. So let's be very careful that we cling to the Savior. I want you to know that all the signs Jesus gave us are converging and warning us that he will return soon. I call all the earthquakes birthquakes. The world is rocking and reeling with the birth pains of Messiah's second coming. Jesus will return, and that's why there's so much upheaval in the world. It's my prayer that without delay, you will make sure that you have received the Lord into your heart. Have you done that? Have you welcomed Jesus as your Savior? If yes, I rejoice. If not, I urge you to delay no longer. Romans 1.4 is a true saying and worthy of all acceptance. Jesus was declared the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of Holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And how shall we escape 
if we ignore so great a salvation. Although these end times are not easy, there has never been a better opportunity for sharing the gospel. And God promises us comfort of the blessed hope of his soon return, even in dark days. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to share with me on social media. You'll enjoy exploring our website at exploits.tv, where you can click online to receive our weekly email updates, learn about our frequent Holy Land teaching tours, and where you can watch all our videos 24-7. And don't forget to download our free Jerusalem Channel app, where you can view also our video library, and please subscribe to our Jerusalem Channel YouTube site. Until next time, I'll always be contending for the faith and praying earnestly for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Christine Dark. Shalom and Maranatha. <laughs>